Well, every day in his life was the same. Wake up before everybody else. Get out of the house in the pitch black. Let the sheep out of their pens. Feed them. Water them. Walk them around a little bit so they get some exercise before the heat of the day. Shearing, grooming, checking for sickness, and most importantly, keep the predators out and make sure that none of them gets away. Repeat, repeat, repeat every day. This day, though, was different. In the middle of his normal morning chores, he heard a familiar voice in the distance yelling, Dave, get over here. And so he hustled and hustled to get to him. And even though he was a considerable ways away, he didn't even break a sweat getting there. And when he gets together, Dave looks at his brother and he says, what's going on? And he said, dad needs you. And he's like, for what? He's like, I don't know. It's some kind of fantasy football draft or something. And Dave's like, I'm in. And so they went back to join everybody else. And when he got there, all seven of his brothers were lined up in birth order, which in my family means holiday family pictures and it's time to go. Um, And so along with his dad was there, there was some old Gandalf looking dude who seemed to clearly be in charge of whatever it was that was happening. And then it got a little bit weirder Everyone was gathered around a dead animal, just staring at it. When Dave got close enough, he realized that the animal was being prepped and prepared for a sacrifice. And almost immediately after the old man saw Dave, he grabbed the biggest bottle of olive oil that he could find and he poured it all over Dave's head and said, this is the chosen one who will bring balance to the force. Sorry, I frequently confuse my Star Wars, Marvel, and the Bible uh, things. Forgive me. Uh, I, I ask your apologies. But the youngest and scrawniest and seemingly least prepared of all the brothers was picked and anointed by the great prophet Samuel to become Israel's future king. And what made no sense to anyone else who was there made perfect sense to God. And then the oddest thing happened. The old guy packed up his stuff and he left. And it wasn't until he left that I imagine all of the questions began to swirl in everyone's heads. His brother started bickering at Dave, like, seriously, dude, like, like why you? I, I don't get it. And Dave, Dave looks at them. He's like, bro, I got no idea. I wasn't even aware it was happening. You invited me here. And in Dave's mind were the same questions that he heard other people asking about him. And he's thinking to himself, why me? You know, the the only, uh, there's already a king in Israel and I'm nowhere near related to him or anybody famous. The only famous officials I know are my sheep prince, Harry, uh, and his clone sister, Dolly, and Barak. Okay, I'm done, I promise, with sheep jokes. And he's like, how's this supposed to happen, God? I mean, am I the king now? Do I wait till he dies? Am I supposed to go and, and kill him right now? And there were so many unanswered questions I imagine there wasn't much sleep that night either. And Dave woke up the next morning early and he just decided to go back to what he always knew, taking care of his dad's farm and taking care of his dad's sheep. But this moment was always seared in the back of his mind that something amazing had been spoken over his future. But for the time being, the future king's assignment was to... Wait. We all love waiting, don't we? Somebody does in here. You can wait my waiting opportunities for me. My message title for today is Waiting in the Wings. And it's a phrase that is a theater and also athletic phrase that we've heard before. And the idea is that someone needs to be prepared to take over the part or the role of a key character at a moment's notice. But in the meantime, they just have to be in the background. And it's uh, an amazing opportunity for someone who gets it because they've spent their whole lives just preparing and waiting and waiting and waiting. And, And once they get kind of put onto the stage or thrust into the game, it can be a moment that thrusts them up into the spotlight or sends them further back into obscurity. It really can be a make it or break it moment. And so I wonder how many of us today feel like we're waiting in the wings. 
And we're looking at God and we're saying, put me in, coach. I got talents, I got skills, I got abilities. And we're waiting for that big break at work or maybe even just for our boss to notice us. You know, we're waiting for that social media post or a set of posts to gain some traction online. We're waiting on the housing market forever and ever. We're waiting on something to come through for our family that's just going to be a game changer. And day after day after day, we're just waiting in the wings. And so here's my big question that I want to start with today to get us going. What if waiting is one of the biggest ways that God actually works in our lives. And that's what we're going to dial into today as we start our journey through the great King David's life. We're actually starting a brand new series today on the life and the leadership of King David, Israel's greatest king, arguably. This is the same David who became a giant killer and a formidable soldier. This is the same David who transformed a struggling nation of disorganized tribes into a well-oiled military machine that became a virtual empire. This is the same David who made some very real and very big mistakes, like the kind that sends normal people to jail, yet who was also called a man after God's heart. This is the same David who would go on to write at least 73 of the Psalms that we have in the Bible. This is the same David whose whole life was defined by anointing and the power of God, yet we see his life was also so much uh, defined by waiting and waiting and waiting. And we're not just talking about a couple of weeks for something to come through or some business thing that he wanted to happen. We're talking years of his life. We're talking in some instances, decades upon decades of waiting in the story of David. And you know, the longer that we walk with God and the more we know about the Bible, the easier it is to know the end of the story. And when you know the end of the story, it becomes harder to put yourself into it and imagine what it must have been like for the person going through it. And I think one of the things that we miss in that with David is the waiting that he went through along the way. Open a Bible to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 16, and this is literally the beginning of David's story where he comes out of complete obscurity, out of nowhere, out of a field, literally, where nobody invited him to the party, and he is thrust into the spotlight to become the future king of Israel. Let me give you a little bit of background before I dig into the Word of God. Israel, the people of God, had demanded a king, even though God didn't want them to have a king. And eventually, God relented, and he gave them over to their desires. But uh, out of, or, but to avoid the king from becoming too powerful, they created the office of the prophet. And it was kind of like a little bit of a checks and balances, if you will, against the king. So that if the king got off track, the prophet would speak against him. But practically, if you read the Old Testament, you know that it never really worked uh, because the king would either ignore the prophet or in some cases he'd try to kill him and appoint his own prophet in his place who would just tell him whatever he wanted to hear. And, and so the first king of Israel that became anointed and appointed was an epic failure and disappointment of a dude by the name of Saul. And chapter 16 picks up with Samuel, the great prophet, realizing that this guy wasn't going to turn around uh, his life, that he wasn't fit to rule the nation and and worse, even his offspring couldn't ever rule uh, in his place. So we're going to pick it up in 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 5. But before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for 14 years of ministry here in Anaheim through City Church. We thank you, Jesus, that you saw fit in this time and space for every single one of us to be here today. And we thank you, Lord, uh, that there's a history here, but we thank you even more that there's a present and a future that you're working here, that you've called us with gifting and anointing, not just in the church, but in our lives. And so today, as we come to this text where we look at what it is to live out calling and wait for fulfillment in the midst of it, when even we've been anointed to see something come to pass, uh, God, we pray that your spirit would open our eyes to see what it's like and what you have for us in the waiting. Would you open our ears to hear what you have? for us to hear. And would you open our hearts today? It, we, we pray that you would help us to become more like Jesus as a result of having been together. In your name we pray. Amen. 
I'll start with 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 5. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel says, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he'll kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do and you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So the story starts out with God telling Samuel to stop grieving over the fact that Saul was an epic failure of a dude and just move on and anoint and appoint a new king. You know, there comes a point when God wants us to stop waiting for change to happen, to stop grieving what could have been or what should have been, and to take a painful step in our lives to implement change. So God told Samuel, fill your horn with oil and go. And you can see in the story that Samuel was visibly afraid of what would happen if Saul found out it was treasonous. And so God told Samuel to guise his plans of going to anoint a new king and saying, you know, if anybody asks you what you're doing. Just tell them you're, you're going to sacrifice and worship to the Lord. Like, oh no, I'm, I'm just going to the Brandon Lake and Phil Wickham concert down the street. That's all I'm doing here. And, and the truth is it wasn't a lie. He was going to worship the Lord, but there was another purpose and another plan that was also at play uh, in verse six, because God was leading him to find that new king. And so here's what happens in verse six. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. So he sees the first of Samuel's sons. He's this big, strong dude, probably a little bit like me, if you can imagine it. Um, And uh, first service thought it was funny. I'm just throwing it out there, okay? Um, But he sees this big, strong dude, tall and everything. And and he's like, oh man, this is gonna be our guy. I can see it. And, And he was stoked that he had found someone who looked the part. And this is, I wanna push pause right here and and ask you a question. Have you ever met someone that everything looked right on the outside, but on the inside, something wasn't right? And, and in this case, it wasn't because Eliab was a bad dude. It wasn't, any, it wasn't even that he didn't love the Lord. It looks like he probably did love the Lord and he was probably a really great dude. He just wasn't the future king of Israel, even though on the outside, it looked like he played the part. And what Israel didn't need here was another Saul. And if you know the story, Saul himself was a formidable soldier. He was a big, burly, and strong dude. And so Israel didn't just need another Saul who looked right on the outside, but wasn't the person for the job on the inside, Israel needed someone whose heart was for God. And so then in verse seven, I love this verse. It says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. And if you're an underliner, highlighter, circler of your Bible, light this next one up. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the, help me out, heart. And and so God took one look at Eliab, and even though everything looked right on the outside, he said, he's not the one. He said, even though it looks right externally, I'm looking at the heart. And the New Living Translation actually translates the second half of verse seven, that the Lord doesn't see things the way that you see them. And this week, when I was reading this, it was like God just got me stuck on that. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. And I just kept hearing it over and over. I'm like, Lord, are you telling me I'm losing my vision? Like, what is going on here? I just, God was hitting me in between the eyes with the reality that it's so tempting in life to look at surface and face value of something. And God says, no, I don't look at that. He says, I look at the heart. And in verses eight through 10, this is what happens next. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not 
chosen these. And, you know, this moment surprised everyone who was there. And I would imagine it might have even been a little bit offensive. It would be a little bit like if you were inviting someone to your house or someone said they were coming to your house and you prepared a virtual, you know, full, full on buffet. You get the appetizers together, you get the salad, you get the main course, you got chicken, you got steak, you got lobster, you got a couple different dessert options. And the person comes up to the table and they look around and say, you know, I don't really see anything that looks good for me to eat here. It's like, who do you think you are, bro? Like, <laughs> just grab something and say, thank you. That's what we're asking here. Um, and, and so really, that's kind of what happened here. And, and so I, I love the next part. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? Like, this is the best you got? And th- th- you can't beat this. He goes, well, there remains the youngest yet, or there re- remains yet the youngest, but behold, he's keeping the sheep. And, and Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. And, and so I love that part where he looks at him, and he's like, what else you got for me? This is not making the cut. And he's like, well, there's Dave, but you know, he stinks. He's out with the sheep. You probably have to clean up. If you want him to come over, it's going to take a while. And he's like, wait, I'll wait right here. Nobody sit down until Dave gets here. And so they went, they send him, and he comes back. And then in verse 16, chapter 16, verse 12, it says, and he sent and brought him in. It says, now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The New Living Translation literally describes David as dark and handsome. You know, my wife can really relate to this verse because I'm sure it's how she felt when she first saw me. Uh, you know, at least that's how I remember the story in my head, you know, and it's like, oh, Woo! You know, you can ask her, right? She's, she's in the back. She'll, she'll, I'll be paying for this one later. Um, no, probably when she saw me, it was more like, you know, this one's a little bit of a fixer-upper, but with some elbow grease, it's a solid long-term investment, okay? That was probably more me. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst. Oh, I back, back, back up. And the Lord said, arise and anoint him, for this is he. And then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. And so from that moment onward, God's hand and God's spirit was upon David for the rest of his life in absolutely everything that he did. And in the next section of the chapter, which I'm not going to read, the scene cuts quite dramatically and intentionally from a literary perspective from David, who God's hand and spirit is upon, to who I'm going to call for probably the rest of the series, Crazy Uncle Saul. And Crazy Uncle Saul is going nuts. They're having to summon musicians to calm him down in his fits, and God's spirit has completely left him. Now, we'll hear a bit more about Saul as the story of David progresses on. That's all I'll say about him for now. So far, though, what an amazing testament to Samuel's obedience. What an amazing story about who God uses, about how God picks people versus how man does that. And what an amazing example of character in young David, who is out minding his business in his father's field, uh, and, and one day gets anointed and appointed to become the king. When you came in today, you should have gotten a note sheet. It's one of the ways that we follow along with the message. You can also go to lovehopecity.com slash notes. The first section on there talks about two short-sighted mistakes that many of us make when we are in a waiting season. And so the first point that I'm going to bring out from there actually doesn't come from what I just read. The first point that I'm going to bring out comes out from the backstory that I briefly mentioned in the message about how God never wanted the Israelites to have a king in the first place, uh, but they griped about it and they complained about it so much that God eventually gave them over to what they felt was best for them and God gave them a king. So the first short-sighted mistake that I think many of us are tempted to make in a waiting season is this. Gripe and complain so much that God gives us what we want to our detriment. You know, the people of Israel, what happened in the story is they grew impatient 
and they demanded a king. Now, I'm not going to read the whole story to you, but in 1 Samuel 8, 10 through 22, I think, uh, there is the whole story of how the people come to Samuel and they are demanding a king. And, and the story starts out with the people coming to him and, and they're saying, oh, you know, Samuel, we want to be like the nations and we want a, a king that is going to rule over us and fight our battles for us and judge justice for us. And, and it all sounded great. Um, and, and Samuel says, you know, you guys don't really know what you're asking for. He says, here's what's going to happen if you get a king. All of your sons are going to be conscripted into the service of the army. He's going to use you to build his chariots and go in front of him. Uh, he's going to use you in all kinds of posts in his government to advance him and, and his people that he has. He's going to take your daughters and he's going to make them bakers and cooks and servants. And he goes on in the end of it and he says, you're actually going to wind up being the king's slaves. And then he goes in the end of the story and he says, and at the end of all of that, you're going to be begging God for relief from this king that you're now demanding. But at that time, the Lord won't hear it and he won't get you out of it. And, and so uh, God warns Samuel and Samuel was told by God to warn the people and give them advice. But then God told Samuel, if they want it, give it to them. And so that's what God ultimately did. Uh, they griped, the people com griped and complained and God gave them a king, even though uh, the, God didn't want his people to have a king. And so before there was ever a screwed up Uncle Saul, there was was a wise Samuel in the background warning them about what would happen if they had a king and they didn't listen. You know, they wanted to be like the nations around them. They thought that that would make them feel secure. They thought that would make them feel happy. And, you know, if you study the, the history of the children of Israel, the period of the United Kingdom of Israel was actually really, really short. It was like two and a half, maybe kings three, depending on how you read the story. And you can see the division kind of under the surface the whole time. It was tenuously held together. Um, and, and so the bottom line is this, God gave him a king and warned him, but they... God said, this is what's going to happen if you want a king. And he's like, fine, I'll give it to you. And sure enough, eventually that United Kingdom fell apart to their detriment. So for us, here's where I want to go with this. I think all of us go through things in our lives that we would love God to get us out of. <laughs> It's like, Lord, bail me out. I'm, the situation is taking way too long. I'm frustrated. I don't want to be dealing with this anymore. Um, and, and in those moments, I think we have a decision to make. We can trust God and continue to faithfully serve him in the midst of whatever it is that we're uh, dealing with, or we can gripe and complain so much to God and to everybody around us that in a weird way, God kind of says, fine, if this other thing is what you think you want, I'm going to give it to you to your detriment. And just like the Israelites, maybe it felt like a win in that moment when they got that king. I'm sure it did, because for a short period of time, there was this united kingdom. And just like that in our lives, maybe it'll feel like a win when we get what we think we want. Uh, but if we do it against the guiding of the counsel of God, it's going to be short-sighted and it's not going to work in the long run. So that's the first short-sighted mistake that we're often tempted to make. Gripe and complain so much that God gives us what we want to our detriment. Here's another short-sighted mistake I think that we're often tempted to make in a waiting season. We allow fear to talk us out of making the right hard decision in front of us. Samuel in this story had given Saul multiple opportunities to repent and to change his life before he took the drastic action to actually remove him as king and anoint and appoint a new one. And you can actually feel the fear in Samuel's heart in the text, when you read it in the Bible, I'll just reread verse two of chapter 16. It says, and Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And so in that moment, you can feel Samuel like, you know, God, I know I'm going to heaven when I die, but I wouldn't, I'd love to not have to die through this situation if I didn't have to, if there was a way around it. And, you know, for many people, when they realize the real danger of whatever God's asking them to do, that's when it's tempting to talk ourselves out of it. And I can imagine, you know, Samuel, if he had succumbed to it, thinking in his head, did God really tell me that I needed to go anoint a new king? Maybe I just need to try praying for Saul again. Oh, Lord, help Saul not to keep being a ding-dong. Lord, help him to change his mind. Uh, and, and it's like, you know, but the truth is, 
Samuel's decision was very wise. It was very sound. And he knew deep down in his heart, Samuel or Saul was not going to change. And it, it was clear by everything that had happened. And so if he had succumbed to the fear here, it would just delay the inevitable decision that Saul needed to go based on his own behavior and the speaking of God over Samuel's life. This is a little sidebar, but I think sometimes as Christians, we misunderstand the biblical command not to fear. When God tells us in his word, fear not, which by the way, is all over the Bible. It is absolutely a command from the Bible. Um, It's true that we should never fear eternal judgment before God. And I think even that implies work towards not fearing death because we know where we're going when our life comes to an end. Um, But if uh, really, if if God has spoken to us about something, we need to move forward in spite of the fear. And in this story, the great prophet Samuel, what I love here is you get a little window into his humanity that he showed some very real visible fear of the consequences of going against Saul. And so I think the there is a place for a Christian to have a healthy fear of the circumstances and what's going to happen. But the difference is that when God asks you to do it, you need to do it anyway, in spite of the fear. And so the point isn't whether a Christian feels fear. The point is whether a Christian lets fear run their lives. The point is whether a Christian uh, makes fear or lets fear talk them out of the good, right, and hard decision that's right in front of them. And that's what I love about Samuel here. He knew the ramifications of what was going to happen. He knew it was going to be risky, uh, but he also knew God had asked him to do it. He felt the fear, but he proceeded accordingly anyways. To me, that is the essence of faith. It's not whether I feel a little fear or a lot of fear. It's whether I do what God had asked me to do or not. And I think it's easy sometimes when we're in a waiting season to talk ourselves out of whatever decision is clear that's right in front of us right now. And those right and hard decisions are often the ones that we put off and we avoid. And sometimes it's hard to know if we need to have a conversation with another person about a topic, or if it's just something we need to kind of deal with at the inside of our own minds and in our own lives uh, without talking to someone else about it. So I actually have a few things that I do in my mind that I want to relay to you about how I know if I need to have a hard conversation with somebody or if it's something I just need to let it go. And so the first thing that I do is if I find myself thinking about something for a few days in a row, that's an indicator. You ever been there in your life where there's something that you know is bugging you and and you're doing something completely unrelated? You're like, I don't want to be thinking about this person right now. And for some reason, no matter how much you try to stuff it down, it just keeps coming up, it keeps coming up, and it keeps coming up. And you're like, I need to deal with this situation. I can't seem to get it out of my mind. So indicator number one for me is if a few days in a row have gone by and I just can't seem to get it out of my mind. Here's another indicator for me. If I keep bringing it up, with my spouse, or uh, and, and it just doesn't seem, or a close friend, and it doesn't seem like it's uh, experiencing any sort of resolution in that way, then that to me is the indicator of, okay, if I need to bring this up to my wife and I'm talking it through with her now, or a close friend, if you're not married, it's a second indicator that's making it stronger. But the one that really is seals the deal for me is if my wife or a close friend after a conversation says, you know, that's a problem. And if you don't deal with this, it's going to continue to eat you away. And so, and I know it's like, okay, if something I thought was maybe an issue and I was trying to minimize it, now suddenly I've talked about it with someone else and now it's become very clear, no, this is actually an issue. I need to address this. And once I know I need to address it, what happens is it switches from like anxiety about the situation to the actual fear of the consequences of what's going to happen when I have the conversation. And sometimes, you know, it's tempting to avoid those hard conversations because we're afraid. And, you know, in my mind, it's like, oh, I'm afraid. 
afraid of offending people. I don't want to hurt their feelings. And, you know, but like I hear God say back to me sometimes, yeah, but Kyle, right now this, is, this situation is offending and bothering you. And so you're not being true to who you want or who God wants you to be. And, you know, sometimes like I don't want to push somebody away. And, and then I hear God or my wife, you know, the voices sound the same. It's so interesting saying, you know, yeah, but Kyle, right now you're pushing yourself away from who you know God wants you to be. And that's not fair. Um, and, you know, so that's a problem with far greater consequences. So listen, I'm never, ever a fan in life of cutting people out of our lives. But what I am a fan of in life is to speak up for our boundaries and to speak up for what's bothering us. Um, and, and so, you know, sometimes you just got to have that hard conversation and say, you know, we need to talk about this situation because it's bothering me and it's leading me to have bad feelings about our relationship. And the classic age old counseling line, when you said this, it made me feel like this. And maybe when you said this, it made me feel like I can't trust you. It made me feel like you weren't reliable. It made me feel like you weren't present in the conversation. It made me feel like you don't care for me, or it made me feel like whatever it is that happened that made you feel as a result of it. You know, we can really allow fear to talk us out of those very important and vulnerable conversations. And in, in a waiting season, it's tempting to be like, ah, oh, you know, I just don't want to deal with this right now. But here's another thing we can let fear talk us out of in a waiting season. We can also let fear fear talk us out of just our bare bones, bottom line obedience to God. And we can be like, you know, uh, I, I'm going through a lot. God understands. And so whether it's, you know, something uh, in, in the realm of sexual purity, in the realm of your truthfulness, in the realm of your honesty, in the realm of your finances or whatever it is, when you know there's a topic in scripture where God has clearly spoken of how we are supposed to live our lives, so often when we're in a waiting season, uh, we can just let fear just excuse away those things. Um, and, and so I'm going to tell you right now something probably probably is not that common to hear in church. You're going to feel fear as a Christian. It's going to happen. Um, the, the, the biblical command not to fear doesn't mean you won't feel the fear. It's just that you don't let that fear talk you out of the hard thing that's in front of you that you need to do. That's what Samuel did here. And, and I think over time in your, our lives, we build up a strength to have less fear once we've done it once and we've seen God do it, that the next time it's going to be okay. And thank God for Samuel's obedience here. Because if he hadn't moved forward in spite of his fear, there wouldn't be a King David. Waiting seasons can feel powerless. We feel like we're waiting on something to happen in the meantime. And while we're waiting, we can ignore the important things God wants us to do right here and right now. So those are a couple of short-sighted things that we can do or be tempted to do when we're in a waiting season. Now I got some things to remember to help us in the midst of a waiting season. And two of them are just straight out of the scriptures here that we just read. And the first one is this, uh, to, to help us in a waiting season, remember this, the Lord doesn't see things the way we see them. The New Living Translation of 1 Samuel 16, 7, just that's ver word for word. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. No one even thought to invite David to this drafting of the future king, let alone imagine that he might be a candidate. The Lord doesn't see things the way that you and I see them. The Lord doesn't look at our lives the way that we do. The Lord doesn't look at our appearance on the outside the way that we do. The Lord doesn't look at our time the way that we do. The Lord doesn't look at our past the way that we do. The Lord doesn't look at our present the way that we do. And the Lord certainly doesn't look at our future the way that we do. The Lord doesn't look at our resources or lack thereof that we think we have the way that we do. The Lord doesn't look at our problems the way that we do. The Lord doesn't look at our families the way that we do. And here's a big one. The Lord doesn't look at other people the way that we do. The Lord looks at the heart. See, here's a game-changing question that I think I came to when I was kind of looking through this message today. If it's true that the Lord doesn't see things the way that I do, then how is God looking right now at whatever 
I'm dealing with. And if I'm missing it, how can I get my perspective shifted to see it the way that God does? And I got great news for all of us today. God actually gave us the Bible and his word as the translation device between his thoughts for our lives and our perception of our lives and what we think we should do. Uh, you know, I love... Uh, and just about any emotion that you're feeling, God has something that would speak to it. If you're feeling sad, not to minimize it in any way, but in the midst of sadness, it's entirely possible to rejoice. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians 5.16, it says to rejoice always. If you are married and you feel like you and your spouse are just at gridlock and you've lost that love and feeling, so to speak, um, and you're just kind of waiting on them to change, I love all throughout scripture where you see the example of what biblical love looks like, my favorite of all of them being in Ephesians chapter five. And if Ephesians chapter five, it talks about how Christ loved the church and, and how he loved the church practically by sacrificing himself for her and washing her with his blood uh, and, and ultimately dying on the cross to save us, his bride, the church. And then the rest of the chapter goes on to paint that as a picture for how husbands and wives are to love each other unconditionally. And so it's really ultimately not in marriage about whether we're having love loving feelings for each other in a moment or not. It's about whether or not we are being Christ to our spouse or attempting as close as possible to model what Jesus would want us to uh, model towards them and how he would want us to treat them. And you know, if sometimes we find ourselves in a situation where we feel like we've been waiting on something and waiting on something and waiting on something, and we just feel like, I can't wait anymore, Lord, this is too hard. I can't keep doing it. I love that we have verses like Isaiah 40, 31. It says, they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The Lord doesn't see things the way that we see them. And sometimes we come to a moment in our lives where we feel like we're absolutely at the end of ourselves and God's like, good, because now I can pour my spirit on you and I can give you more. And you didn't think you could wait anymore. You didn't think you could love anymore. But by the power of God, through the Holy Spirit indwelling you from the inside out, you can. And you can keep going. The Lord doesn't see things the way that we see them. We sell ourselves short so much of what God wants to do in our lives. Uh, and so next time you find yourself in a waiting season, remind yourself that the Lord doesn't see things the way that you see them and ask God to help you see what he's seeing so you can translate and tune your heart to do what he wants you to do. And this is the second thing to keep in mind to help us in a waiting season. The Lord looks at the heart. First Samuel 16, 7, people judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Your life might not look the way that you think it's supposed to look right now, but if your heart is right with God, friend, I wanna tell you, you are right where you need to be, doing exactly what you need to be doing. You might feel today like you're running into complete obscurity. You feel unseen, you feel unnoticed. Maybe you feel like people are telling you that you're too young to try to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish, or maybe you feel like you're past your Prime, and it's too late, and you'll never amount to the dreams that you had hoped you'd have for yourself. All of us have a reason or many reasons to discount what we're doing or what we're trying to do. Friends, that was David, 100%. He was out in the field taking care of his daddy's flock. Nobody knew his name, and he spent most of his days alone and forgotten in the hills. Friend, as long as you're running after God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your soul, and with all your mind, that's all that matters. God can pluck you out of obscurity and into divine objective for his glory. But I want to tell you, he won't do it if our heart's not right. One of the things I love about this story when you just kind of side by side and you take Saul and you take David is you see that they actually had a lot in common. They were both formidable soldiers. They were both incredibly talented. They were both strong. But you know, talent doesn't impress God. And in fact, talent can be very dangerous without character because talent can take us to places that our character can't keep us. And if we're not careful, 
we're gonna wind up just like King Saul, who was talented as all get out, but whose character couldn't keep him where his talent had put him, and he was plucked out of his position. You know, David was called a man after God's own heart, and David's heart for God was the reason that the Lord had anointed and appointed him and used him so greatly. And so, friend, today for us, I think the question for us shouldn't be, God, how can I pray better so that you accelerate this ending uh, the end, or this waiting time to come to an end? Uh, I don't think the question uh, should be for us to pray for God to give us an out and for things to end. I think the question for us should be, Lord, where is my heart today. Because the Lord looks at the heart. And so church, I just want to turn to you and talk to you for a minute. How's your heart with God? How is your relationship with God doing right now? And I'm going to actually bring us back to the big what if question that I started the message with. What if the greatest evidence of God working in your life right now is how well you are waiting on or living for God while you're waiting on him to fulfill something right now. And this takes me to the third thing that I want you to jot down to remember in a waiting season. And it's this, waiting is a primary way God works. And if you notice, there's an extra word there, the with a parentheses, And I'll tell you why. It's really bad grammar to have A and the next to each other, but it's good teaching, and I'll unpack it hopefully in just a minute. I am absolutely convinced that waiting is one of the primary ways that God works in our lives. But I'll tell you what I'm wrestling with right now. I think waiting might be the primary way that God works in our lives. Now, I'm not convinced. That's why I'm putting it in parentheses. I'm putting a question mark, and y'all can judge me later. Send me emails. Call me a heretic. Go to another church. It's fine. I'll miss you forever, and I'll never get over it, but it's cool. Uh, Anyway, um, but, but what if, what if waiting and the times when we think nothing's happening and we're frustrated with God and we're like, Lord, oh, when is this gonna end? You called me to this thing. You spoke this promise over me. Why am I not seeing it yet? What if that waiting is the primary way that God actually works on the thing that the Lord says that he looks at, which isn't the outward appearance, but is the, help me out, heart. What if the waiting is how God works on our hearts to tune us into what he's doing so we're not full of ourselves and we're not full of our achievements and the things that we think we're supposed to do in life and God's like, time out. I don't look at outward appearance. I don't look at success. I don't judge by any of those things. He said, Kyle, I look at your heart. How is your heart? And sometimes, I don't know what it is, but the only thing to get this guy on stage to slow down is to make me wait. And waiting is where I have to just think about what God's doing. Did I just lose my mic? Am I good? Is it good? Okay. You know, I look at David, who had an unmistakable upward call of God on his life but he waited to advance his life and his kingship the right way. And so David made mistakes. We're going to see lots of them along the way in the series, but there's a reason he's called a man after God's own heart. And I look at you and I look at me and I just think all of us are waiting on something. And I'm convinced it's how we love the Lord and obey him in the midst of those waiting seasons that is one of the primary ways that God works on our hearts. And, and, and that shows our faith and our obedience more than anything else. When I look in this room, I see a room full of people who are waiting in the wings. And you're not waiting in the wings for self-glory or you know, some great achievement for your own life. You're waiting in the wings for God to use you. And you're just waiting for that day to say, Lord, give me those opportunities. Uh, and, and, and it's not probably just gonna be one moment. It's probably gonna be many moments in your life. But I wanna suggest to you today that those big moments when God uses you in your life are gonna be held up by all the little moments all along the way where we wait on God and love him faithfully every day. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for waiting with us. Thank you for loving us in the midst of uh, everything that we go through. Lord, just like David, you call us to yourself. We wanna be men and women after your heart. Thank you for taking us in all of our flaws and our failures. And right now, God, I just wanna repent of, our, of impatience, of times when 
you're doing something, you're painting a bigger picture, but I want it now. And you're working on the more important thing instead. You're working on my heart. And so God in this church today, work on our hearts. Help us to get right with you. If there's sin we need to confess, if there's something we need to lay at the altar and let go, we bring it to you now, Jesus. And if you're here today and you've been window shopping God and the Bible and the claims of Christianity, but you're to walk out the doors of the church or turn off the screen and you genuinely don't know if you go to heaven when you pass away, I'm here to tell you that God brought you here today to settle the question once and for all. You know, God promises to do four things for you. He promises to forgive you of your sin, to adopt you into his family, fill you with his Holy Spirit and give you an eternal life. But there's one catch. Jesus wants the steering wheel of your heart. And so if that's you and you know the question's not settled, settle it now with this simple prayer. God's gonna hear the faith wherever you're at. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin and the sins of the world. I believe you died there and I believe you rose from the grave so I could have everlasting life. Lord, come into my life, forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me the power to live this life for you. God, I'm tired of running. Here's the steering wheel of my heart. Take over. In Jesus' name, God's people sit. Amen.